Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, new questions about the federal rules designed to keep COVID-19 variants out of Canada. We're getting caught in the middle of a logistical nightmare. Also tonight, after a military coup, what's next in Myanmar? We're also worried about a larger crackdown on civil society. We'll hear Canada's response. I get really emotional talking about it because it absolutely tore my heart out. Two provinces and their practice of birth alerts. And new life for a significant spiritual home. This is the church that our ancestors built. Remaking Harriet Tubman's Canadian Connection. This is The National. The pandemic's second wave that has disrupted much of Canadian life for so long seems to be slowing. Overall, infection numbers are dropping. But as that's happening, there's growing evidence of COVID-19 variants in several provinces. Alberta alone just confirmed it's had 51 in total. The federal government will soon impose travel restrictions and safety protocols meant to slow the spread of those variants. We're going to take a hard look at those, but we begin with the latest on what we know about the variants themselves. Here's Christine Birak on where they are and how they're affecting Canadians so far. So far, two workers at this meatpacking plant in Toronto have tested positive for the variant first identified in the UK. I actually think that's a really big kind of yellow to red flag. Health officials say it appears one of those workers also infected someone they live with. Places that have had the variants take over, it really takes over remarkably over a period of weeks. For instance, doctors say by the time the first variant case was identified at this long-term care home, 55 more people were infected within two days. Ontario also announced today its first case of another variant originating in South Africa. This was detected in a resident in Peel region. Um, this case is under investigation, has no history of travel and no known contact with person who has traveled. They're all bad signs. In a release, Peel's medical officer said he's extremely concerned, noting while residents have been flattening the curve, community spread of this variant may change this suddenly. BC has now identified four cases of the variant from South Africa, including one possible case in a school. This is one of the things that is factoring in to all of the, the decisions that we have to make together over this next coming weeks. While the variant first observed in the UK appears to spread faster and might be more deadly, the variant first seen in South Africa also involves small mutations on the virus's spike. Those changes could make it harder for antibodies to recognize the virus and destroy it. Experts say as COVID cases in Canada slow down, provinces shouldn't even consider loosening restrictions. My best advice to your audience is everything you know you're supposed to do to protect yourself from, from COVID, you need to double your efforts. If not, experts say these new variants could bring a new surge in infections. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. Now let's turn to those new federal travel measures aimed at preventing variants from entering Canada. The rules haven't begun yet, but as Alan Morrow tells us, some are already questioning their effectiveness. After a long flight from Sweden, Jennifer Erickson has one final leg of her journey, a now mandatory COVID test at Pearson Airport. I thought it was going to be really bad, but uh, it just tickles <laughs> a lot. And now you're away. Yeah, Whee! But soon it won't be that easy. Arriving in Canada will mean a stay at a quarantine hotel, there for up to three days at a cost of $2,000, a travel deterrent as new, more contagious variants spread. Our current rules are among the strictest in the world. They also mean Ravi Sharma's parents might not see the birth of his first child. He and his wife were planning on their help, but they can't afford the new hotel fee. It brings a lot of emotions. If a family member is uh, traveling for, for a compassionate reason, should there be a uh, different measuring stick for them? It's a question Phil Mowat, a Canadian in the UK, is asking too. His 91-year-old father in British Columbia has Alzheimer's. Worst case scenario is that uh, there could be uh, an urgent health crisis or, or something. I just wouldn't make it over. Uh, that I I could get I could come over uh, 
to see a grave. Another measure, all flights to Mexico and the Caribbean have been canceled until April 30th, seemingly an attempt to limit March break travel. But the government is not halting flights to sun destinations in the U.S. Florida reported nearly 8,000 new COVID cases just yesterday. The variant is already here. Dr. Suman Chakrabarty says the focus should be less on travel and instead. We should look to see where it's going to cause the most uh, damage. You know, essential workplaces where we're seeing a lot of transmission, you know, congregate living settings, long-term care. This is where we should be focusing our attention. Back at Pearson, relief from some passengers to be back home and to be tested. I'm really glad to see that there's a a free testing as soon as possible. No one ever knows how they will react to getting COVID. Okay, so Ellen, can you take us back to the notion of quarantine hotels? Do we know more about when that rule would be enforced? We don't for sure, Andrew. Transportation Minister Omar Al Gabra said yesterday that that requirement could come into effect as early as this Thursday, but that has not been officially announced and we did not get any more specifics on that today. One important note here is that since the pandemic began, less than 2% of all cases in Canada have been directly linked to international travel. So those public health measures, masking, distancing, staying at home, they don't become any less important Important with these new restrictions coming into effect. Okay, Ellen Morrow, thanks for this. You're welcome. Now let's explore how that mandatory hotel stay adds to the burden of some cancer patients, those who require regular visits to the United States to access treatments that they can't get here. Tanya Fletcher spoke to two women in BC who want to be exempt from that rule. It's literally threatening my life. Kimberly Muse isn't talking about the stage four cervical cancer she's battling. She's talking about the roadblocks in the way of the one thing she says is saving her life. It feels like month after month the access to that treatment is getting threatened by these, by these restrictions for non-essential travel. Muse travels to California every month to take part in a clinical trial. She sent us this video en route. Made it to Seattle. Okay, there's the space needle. Driving from Vancouver to Seattle, she then catches a flight to Los Angeles. 24 hours later, after her appointment, she returns home to a 14-day mandatory quarantine. It was already taking a toll on her family when suddenly last week, more rules were announced. And then with the most recent COVID testing, we started looking at the logistics around the COVID tests and what the implications would be and how that could potentially make me miss my flights. Ottawa previously denied her an exemption as an essential traveler. Now she fears the new requirement to quarantine at a hotel for three nights at her own expense will make the burden too much to bear. And she's not alone. We're getting caught in the middle of a logistical nightmare. Anna Nayarati is in a similar position, traveling to the U.S. every three weeks for colon cancer treatments. I've got my UV sanitizer. She took this video while finishing her most recent quarantine at home. As soon as the two weeks are up, she heads straight back to the States. We need to travel. Ours is for an essential service. And there are other Canadians that are in my position where at one point or another, the deadlines don't meet and they'll have to miss their medical treatments. So far, the federal government says there will only be very limited exceptions to the hotel quarantine requirements. Health Canada says more details on the new measures will be provided in the coming days. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, Ottawa says it has received assurances that export controls on vaccines introduced by the European Union will not affect vaccine delivery. We have received repeated reassurances that shipments of vaccines to Canada will not be affected. So the federal government says it has several verbal reassurances from the EU, though not in writing. Canada is not named on an official exemption list. Now, as in some other provinces, Manitoba shows signs of a slowdown in new COVID-19 cases. But a disproportionate number of cases are still coming from the north. Cameron McIntosh looks at new efforts to get vaccines to those communities. I'm going to be giving you your COVID vaccine today, okay? okay. First in line in what is now Manitoba's COVID hot zone. 74-year-old Vic Kizzle, one of a handful of healthcare workers vaccinated in Thompson. How did you feel about getting this vaccine? 100%. I think everybody should have it. Vast and sparsely populated logistics in Manitoba's north are tricky. Over the coming months, it's hoped this vaccination super site will accommodate much of the population. Healthcare aide Aubrey Queen works with the elderly. 
it's going to save lives at the end of the day. Another 5,300 first doses are also being delivered to remote First Nations, where issues like overcrowding are driving Indigenous infection rates well above the rest of the population. First Nations people make up 50% of hospitalizations currently and 52% of ICU admissions. We will address these gaps by ensuring that younger First Nations people have access to the vaccine sooner. After months in COVID's grip, there's hope in other parts of the province. Overall case numbers and test positivity rates down today to their lowest levels since mid-November, as restrictions have loosened slightly. Uh, we want to keep going in this direction, so please stay safe. Still, progress they warn will be slow. A lot depends on getting those shots out. I'm just ready to get back to normal lives and get over with this pandemic. For now, under the provincial plan, it's healthcare workers and the most vulnerable that are getting vaccinated. It'll be well into March before the rest of the population starts getting shots, provided the vaccines arrive on time. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Ontario says it'll expand testing in schools as thousands of students returned to the classroom. We want to make sure parents have access to immediate and efficient and fairly seamless testing. The province also says it'll allow student teachers to fill supply roles this year to help address staffing shortages. Nearly 300,000 students resumed in-class learning today, but schools in Ontario's hotspots remain closed. The province says it will update their opening status on Wednesday. A dozen Canadian businesses are joining forces to pilot a COVID-19 rapid test program in hopes of reopening workplaces. Twelve companies are involved, including Air Canada, Scotiabank, Shoppers Drug Mart. The pilot tests workers twice a week and uses millions of rapid tests obtained by the federal government. Well, starting today, businesses hit hard by the pandemic can apply for government-backed loans under a new federal program. We all know sectors like tourism have been devastated, but some worry that the program could ultimately pose more risk to business owners. Catherine Cullen shows us why. How are we doing this week? The answer these days in the hospitality sector is never good. The days are, are, are they're brutal. Our company at the uh, it started, we had probably uh, approximately full and part-time 360 employees. We're now down to 50 to 60 employees, depending, and uh, uh, it breaks my heart. Occupancy is a tenth of what it was, he says, and he believes it will be months and months before the tide turns. Now, for those industries suffering the most, a new program. The new Highly Affected Sectors Credit Availability Program, or HASCAP offering loans of up to a million dollars that can be paid back over 10 years. These are 100% Government of Canada-backed loans. Business groups welcome the new source of funds. We've got um, a lot of folks that have already gone through you know, their firewall of savings from you know, 2019 and prior, um, and now are, are um, feeling a little desperate. Some union groups argue the loan should be tied to a guarantee workers will keep their jobs. And even industry groups worry about businesses taking on more debt. We are uh, pressing and hoping uh, that uh, the federal government will change their mind and make a portion of this loan forgivable because that would certainly help. The Minister of Small Businesses' office says we strongly encourage businesses that need additional liquidity to apply. But a government official says it's not likely any of this loan will be made forgivable because other programs already do that. John Nicholson's company won't be applying. They don't want to take on more debt. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, Saskatchewan and PEI today joined other provinces in stopping birth alerts. That's where women, often Indigenous, are flagged as high risk and in many cases separated from their newborns. Critics say it is discriminatory and that more needs to be done to support women who are struggling. Bonnie Allen shows us two Saskatchewan women who know what that's like. Just two years ago, Ariane Ross could not have imagined a day like this. Back then, she was addicted to crystal meth. Three of her children had been apprehended, and a social worker warned her it could happen again. We confirmed that I was pregnant, and she said, OK, so there will be a birth alert put on for you at the hospital. Scenes like this, captured at a Winnipeg hospital, show the heart-wrenching reality of birth alerts. Newborns seized from their mothers, women struggling with addiction, homelessness or domestic violence. 
that fear actually motivated me to stay clean, to not risk losing my child. Ross was able to find help on her own. She got treatment, then moved into a supportive housing program. But too often, women are left without support. Melissa April had birth alerts on three pregnancies. I get really emotional talking about it because it absolutely tore my heart out. The recovering addict had her first two babies apprehended within hours of birth. But I, I was sober and I was ready. They already made their decision before they got there. Then for her third pregnancy, a family doctor connected April with this place, a care home for moms and babies called Sanctum 1.5. It takes a different approach. Meeting that person where they're at in their journey and then starting to build supports around them so that they can succeed. I didn't think I could mother. Um, Sanctum is what, what really saved me. Now she's reunited with her family. Us mothers are the best for our babies. <laughs> Ariane Ross has also rebuilt her family. It's just amazing. It's amazing. I do think that it, this is a good opportunity to look into um, different ways that women can be supported and versus just threatened. Both women say birth alerts should be replaced with more compassionate support programs that keep moms and babies together in a safe, healthy way. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. An emergency meeting has been called by the United Nations Security Council for tomorrow to talk about Myanmar. The military there has seized power and detained Aung San Suu Kyi and other elected leaders, overthrowing what was already a delicate democracy. I think it would be a mistake for anybody, particularly in the army side of things, to, to think that you can, you can just snuff this out and things nobody will notice. It's not like that. But Bob Ray also warns that armies don't give up power easily in situations like this. And as Rene Filipponi tells us, the concern around the world tonight is what happens next. Troops on patrol across Myanmar. A show of force following a military coup in a country where democracy is fragile. The army assaulted people as it carried out the coup, says this man, who describes his country as a bird learning to fly, and now the army has broken its wings. Prominent politicians were detained this morning, including Aung San Suu Kyi, the country's civilian leader since 2015. Her party won a landslide election in November, but army leaders have alleged mass fraud and used it to justify the takeover, announced on television today. This is a manufactured military narrative. Uh, the people who have been interviewed and the people we've talked to are basically saying they don't believe it was fraudulent. Despite a celebration on the streets for military supporters, Suu Kyi is very popular. In a letter to her supporters, she urged people to protest the coup. We're also worried about a larger crackdown on civil society, uh, you know, on the democracy activists, the land activists, the other people who the military would see as uh, potential catalysts for a protest movement. The takeover was led by General Min Ong Hlaing, who has been condemned by the international community for alleged genocide against the Rohingya, the country's mostly Muslim minority. In recent years, hundreds of thousands fled to neighboring Bangladesh in the wake of a deadly army crackdown. Aung San Suu Kyi has been criticized for failing to condemn the army and its actions. But with the military back in full control, there are concerns things will only get worse for the Rohingya who remain in Myanmar. In Yangon today, people line up at banks and stock up on food, unsure of what lies ahead. With the powerful military in control and a year-long state of emergency declared. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, the mayor of Rochester, New York, has suspended officers involved in the handcuffing and pepper spraying of a nine-year-old girl on Friday. The incident was captured on a body camera and a warning for you. What you're about to see is pretty unsettling to watch. I want my dad! Come on. I'm going to pay for you and I don't want to. Sit back. Then sit back. Come on. Uh, yes, this is your last chance, otherwise pepper spray is going in your eyeballs. Come on. An internal investigation is now underway. The incident reignited protests in the city, which was rocked by protests last March following the death of a black man, Daniel Prude, at the hands of police. Well, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris pledged solidarity with Canada in the cases of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, two Canadians detained in China. A White House statement said that during a conversation with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau today, Harris pledged to work to secure their release. It was her first call with a foreign leader since being sworn in as vice president. 
The PMO also said the pair discussed a number of other topics, including the pandemic and the U.S.'s new Buy American policies. Well, a major winter storm is pummeling the U.S. East Coast tonight. The gentleman had to hold me because I was flat, like I was lifting off the ground. Next on The National, blizzard-like conditions slam the brakes on COVID vaccinations. We'll take you inside a COVID isolation hotel, preparing to welcome guests who have nowhere else to go. We're hoping to uh, fill the place. Really? Yeah. And the Canadian astronaut swapping out his spacesuit for hospital scrubs. Each one of those cases is a, is a human being that is really suffering. Dr. David Saint-Jacques on his new mission. We're back in two. Welcome back. Take a look at one view in Connecticut tonight, where they are still getting hit by a major winter storm. And Connecticut is far from alone. A huge swath of the U.S. eastern seaboard is getting pummeled. Major U.S. cities from Washington to New York are being buried in snow, canceling flights and bringing everything from schools to public transit to a standstill. And it's on the move, coming our way, tracking up towards Atlantic Canada tomorrow. Stephen D'Souza has more on how the storm is hampering an already strained pandemic response. As the snow piled up, New Yorkers dug out. With the wind whipping, they braced themselves and held on. The gentleman had to hold me because I was flat, like I was lifting off the ground. The outdoor dining shelters that withstood a mild January were shut down in advance of the storm, as New York City and neighboring New Jersey each declared a state of emergency, the storm forcing the cancellation of dozens of flights and commuter trains. But if you don't need to be out, do not go out. And if you're out right now and you don't need to be out, safely find your way home, lock the door, sit on the couch, and stay home. The storm stretched from Washington, D.C. up to Boston. New York City banned all non-essential travel until Tuesday morning, though some health care workers still had to plow on. Man, it's crazy out here. Everyone can't stay at home. I wish I could stay at home today. This is the worst snowstorm to hit New York City in five years. But apart from the transportation concerns, the biggest worry is the impact it's going to have on the already delayed vaccine rollout. Already beset by supply delays and scheduling problems, COVID vaccinations were canceled in New York City until at least Wednesday. Six mega sites in New Jersey were also closed today. Based on what we are seeing right now, uh, we believe that tomorrow uh, getting around the city will be difficult. Uh, it'll be icy, it'll be treacherous. We do not want seniors, especially out in those conditions. You can have your ID out. Yep. In, your in Boston, a new vaccination site just opened at Fenway Park, home of the Red Sox. They rushed this morning to complete appointments before the storm hit. The storm, meanwhile, continues to lurch slowly north, lingering in some areas until Tuesday morning. In the end, it's expected the storm could leave behind anywhere from 40 to 60 centimeters of snow. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Well, 90s sitcom star Dustin Diamond, known for his character Screech, has died. No, actually you've helped me. You've made me realize that there are a million fish in the sea and I'm just a worm to attract them. <laughs> Diamond portrayed an endearing nerd on Saved by the Bell. He also had a troubled legal history. In 2015, he was sentenced to four months in jail for stabbing a man in a bar. Diamond's manager says the 44-year-old died of lung cancer after being diagnosed just a few weeks ago. And legendary singer Tony Bennett is battling Alzheimer's disease and has been for more than five years, his family has revealed. Smile even though it's breaking When there are clouds in the sky Despite his illness, the 94-year-old continued to record and perform. His last concert was less than a year ago, in March 2020. Bennett's wife first told AARP magazine about the diagnosis, saying they kept it secret so Bennett could continue working. As for how he's doing now, the article says his moments of clarity are increasingly rare. Okay, next on The National. Free accommodations in a COVID hotspot. So if they're here, they're not exposing their family to perhaps the virus. 
an exclusive look inside a so-called isolation hotel as it prepares to welcome its first guests. And Dr. David Saint-Jacques, why the Canadian astronaut has joined the front lines of the pandemic. Welcome back. It's not always easy to isolate after getting a positive coronavirus test, especially for people who live with others. In some communities, the answer is a so-called isolation hotel. A new one of those just opened today near Toronto. And just before it did, David Common got a tour. Hey, Leslie, so this is an isolation hotel. It is. Not far from Pearson Airport, this is the fourth isolation hotel to open for any resident in Peel Region. And these are people who have either got COVID or have had an exposure and are at risk of contracting That's right. the virus? That's right. Either positive already for COVID, think they might have COVID, or are close contact of somebody who has COVID. The pool closed, fitness center too, the whole place reserved for those isolating, all 100 rooms. Are you expecting that kind of demand? Yes, we absolutely are. We're hoping to uh, fill the place. Peel Region, home to many essential workers, has some of the country's highest COVID rates and where at-risk grandparents, working parents and school-age kids often live under one roof. So hotels like this may be the only safe alternative. So if they're here, they're not exposing their family to perhaps the virus. It's very hard in multi-generational homes. There's 24-hour on-site nursing staff, cleaners too, TV and Wi-Fi to stave off boredom, and a varied menu with everything from hamburgers to vindaloo. So this is one of the typical rooms. Mm -hmm. You'll see uh, they have their private bathroom with shower, a couple of really nice, comfortable beds here. It's just like a regular hotel room. Absolutely, just like any hotel room. There's a it's also free paid for with emergency funding from the feds and the province, an investment, they say, in stopping the virus's spread. Care is also offered in multiple languages, a service sensitive to Peel Region's many cultures. Amik Singh is one of the nurses here. See someone coming positive here with COVID, their anxiety is here. To hear a common language, I'm Punjabi sick myself. If I agree with a patient and say, Sasuko, how are you doing? Their anxiety is down here, so it's easier to understand, do a complete health assessment. There are also separate quarantine facilities for arriving international travelers with nowhere safe to isolate. Run by federal officials, they look similar. Travelers escorted to a hotel room, provided meals and plentiful snacks. It's comfortable, but can be lonely. This video provided to us by someone who spent two weeks inside seeing only hazmat suit wearing cleaners, sometimes as they pass by the peephole in the door. And once a day, there is outdoor time in the parking lot, fenced off for everyone's safety. Hi, my name is Rashid. I'm the nurse on staff here today. I'm just gonna Back at Peel's Hotel for residents, not travelers, nurse Rasheen Oliver remembers one woman whose illness worsened as her anxiety rose. Oliver had to convince her to go to hospital. She was there for 21 days and essentially after um, she was discharged, she got in contact with me to thank me for sending her to the hospital because if she would have stayed in the hotel room and she realized that at that point, that she probably would have died. It reminds me of why I'm here people who really come out and they show that I appreciate what you're doing. You can call us anytime. We're here 24 seven. Peel region is opening a fifth hotel soon, expecting more demand, all based on a simple premise. Getting more people in here is one step to stopping COVID out there. David Coleman, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. Now, someone who knows what it's like to live in isolation is Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques. The last time the National spoke to him, things looked a lot different. We don't feel lonely. Uh, you just, I just wish I could uh, hug my kids from time to time. Back then, we had been following his journey to space from the start. All these training sessions, uh, they represent things that I must know and I must master 
I don't want to survive. Now, St. Jacques is embarking on a whole different kind of training, trading in his spacesuit for scrubs and still learning, this time on the front lines in a COVID unit at the McGill University Health Center. And joining us now, Dr. David St. Jacques in Montreal. Uh, Dr. St. Jacques, boy, what, what a difference a couple of years makes since the last time we chatted. Uh, two questions. How are you and, and, and why go back to practicing medicine? Hi, Andrew. Yeah, indeed. What things have changed, eh? What a state this planet is that I came back to. Uh, come back to medicine for me. You know, I was a physician before working, uh, before becoming recruited for, uh, the, for the astronaut program. And uh, I'd always wondered whether it was possible to go back to clinical practice after 10 years. Basically, that's when I moved to Houston uh, for, you know, full-time training. And uh, this, the pandemic has kind of prompted me to I just wanted to do something useful, you know, and I asked the Collège de Médecins du Québec, who are the authority here for our physicians, uh, and uh, and the universities, and yeah, there is a way for a, an old rusty physician to get recertified on a, <laughs> in a university setting, and there we are, I'm not the only one, so, uh, yeah. you know, it's my second week now, it's, uh, it's a steep hill to climb, but uh, I kind of sleep better now that I feel like I'm doing a kind of a, you know, tangible well yeah I, I mean can I, can I ask you what that process has been like because you are in in the process of of the training so what's it like being back in a hospital setting particularly in the context of a pandemic yeah so as most hospitals have a they kind of uh, assemble all the covid patients together on one unit to kind of protect the rest of the hospital and same thing with the staff, uh, physicians, nurses, everybody kind of stayed on the COVID side or the non-COVID side. So I'm on those uh, so-called hot uh, COVID units uh, where uh, there's very varied teams. People kind of volunteer to join those units. So we get physicians and nurses from all other specialties that kind of pitch in for a day, an evening, a week, uh, whatever uh, they can afford to do. Uh, so it's a really kind of a, a, kind of a, you know, a multidisciplinary kind of teamwork uh, attitude. I, I, you know, it occurred to me when I'm thinking about what it, what it must say about the state of the world, the state of the country right now, that you felt the need to do this, right? I mean, this, these are pretty exceptional steps that you've taken to get involved once again. What does that say about where we're at in this pandemic? I mean, I think this is, it's the big fight going on. This is the, this is the battle of at least the year and maybe several years. Uh, so, uh, um, everybody, I think, feels the kind of the need to do something. Uh, and so there's many ways that you can help, be it only to you know, help your neighbor who's a nurse, uh, getting, you know, shoveling the snow from her cars. It can be something, simple things like that. I feel like, you know, we say it uh, in French, uh, you know, uh, when you help, you feel better about it. And I think uh, it's part of it. There's uh, this is you, you all have to do our part. One last question for you. What is it that, that, I don't know, that, that you've seen on the ground that you think would benefit Canadians to have a, a, a better appreciation of, either of the effects of COVID or, or the people who yeah. are helping to, to try to make it better? So there's one, there's one thing that kind of has been a bit, a bit of a wake-up call for me. I think like a lot of people, I tended to see COVID as either a very benign infection, you're, you test positive or you don't really have any symptoms, or we also hear about the people whom for COVID as a catastrophe and they end up dying of it in intensive care intubated. But there's not these two, between these two extremes, there's a lot of people, there's thousands of people whom for COVID is just extremely traumatic. They go through hell in hospital and they will recover, but it's, it's terrible with bad, you know, huge imp uh, impact on their families. I was, it was a, I was a bit uh, startled when I admitted under my care a guy about my age with no particularly bad disease beforehand and literally in good shape. And, but for him, COVID was like you know, a disaster. And, and it has, a, I think that's something that we tend to forget. We just see numbers, but each one of those thousands of people we hear about were hospitalized. Uh, it's, it's a disaster. It's just a human catastrophe. Well, Dr. Saint-Jacques, I, I always appreciate tapping into your expertise, but, but also your, your insights. Uh, so thank you for making the time for us today. I really appreciate that. And when we come back, facing another year of academic uncertainty. Don't try and relate this to past experiences that you've had, because it's just, it's nothing compared to it. How the pandemic is forcing a lot of students to rethink their post-secondary education, next.
Welcome back. This time of year, a lot of students are applying for university or college and deciding what courses they'll take. Now, of course, this year, the pandemic has turned so many plans upside down. As Deanna Sumanak Johnson found, some are even thinking about putting those plans on hold. As a competitive figure skater, Danica Ellis Dawson believes that sometimes you just have to keep going, even if things don't go as planned. With her university applications now in, she's determined to start first year in the fall, whether it ends up being online or in person. So the second best scenario, it would kind of just be doing it from home. Like I'd still get to stay at home and spend one more year with my family and all my friends and do skating. And then by the second year, I'd be able to like fully commit to school. She considered taking a gap year to keep skating and start work, but decided against it. Who even knows if I'll be able to get a job and like be able to commit full time, depending if it shuts down again. With application deadlines now over or fast approaching, anyone applying for post-secondary education this winter has some tough choices to make. Decisions their parents never had to face. Don't try and relate this to past experiences that you've had because it's just, it's nothing compared to it. That's Mika LeBlanc's message to adults. She got accepted at McGill University back in the fall. But disappointed that all her classes were online, she enrolled only part-time. Adjusting to university life in a virtual setting was tough. Having like no relationship with the teachers or the profs at all and no relationship with any of my classmates and being one of like 600 students in my political science class. And so her mind's made up for next September. If courses are online, she won't go. The organization representing Canadian universities said in a statement, we are all experiencing this pandemic in real time, and it is too early to say what the world will look like at the beginning of the next academic year. But many young people aren't holding their breath to find out. Ben Vogels backed out of universities back in September when he learned the courses would be online and he didn't apply for next fall. I work in construction uh, five days a week, all day pretty much. So uh, just keeping on that track and uh, waiting for this to uh, cool down and hopefully get back into physical school. If not, he may pursue a trade among the many young people trying to decide whether to change path or stick to the course first planned as they take their first steps into adult life in the middle of a pandemic. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so that's how some young Canadians are feeling right now. A lot of uncertainty about what's ahead. So for more on this, let's bring in Behan Farhadi. She's been researching the impact of online learning as a postdoctoral visitor at York University, also a secondary school teacher at the Toronto District School Board. So, so Behan, can you start just by walking us through what your own experiences with students have told you about the range of concerns people are feeling as we approach the, the year mark into this pandemic? What I'm consistently hearing is that students are overwhelmed and they are feeling very, um, you know, pressured to proceed as if business, it was business as usual. And, and there's a variety of ways that they're coping with that. And, and do they have the supports that they need to cope with that? I think part of the supports students need is communication that they're learning during a pandemic and that they don't need to proceed at the pace that they would on a regular year. As it stands, everything uh, this year has kind of been as if it were any other year. There hasn't been adjustments to the amount of curriculum that needs to be covered. And there are just there's so much uncertainty around learning that they're inevitably they're experiencing disruption. Mm. But I guess it also strikes me that that students succeed when when teachers succeed. Right. I mean, do they have the supports they need? And, and for that matter, what are the supports that they would need in this kind of a situation? The supports teachers need most is the uh, ability to exercise their professional judgment and the 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 tools to do so, and, and that includes virtual tools for for high schools that are um, either hybrid or you know in in many in many parts of of the province learning online entirely. And so so what does that what does that look like, right? Because I mean, every school is going to be different. They're all going to have different different access to to different kinds of resources. So so what specifically is it that the teachers would would get that that would be helpful for them? I think when teachers hear that students are struggling 
with court content and they are unable to spend the time necessary to, to, to sort of bridge that knowledge because they, you know, because of the pressure in the day and how much they need to cover because the, uh, the synchronous mandate forces them to have to engage with whole groups for a really long period of time. Mm. It prevents individualized instruction and it, it prevents them from providing the supports. I know students can't even, many students can't access digital books or digital resources. Uh, there's definitely a lack of uh, resources online compared to face-to-face. -to -face. Right. So, so then, uh, sort of if I'm putting myself in the shoes of a, a student, maybe even one making a big decision about my future uh, post-secondary, what is the advice that you would give me in that situation? I think no matter wh what choice students make, they're not going to be alone in making it and and giving um, giving themselves a little grace uh, and and you know permission to to do what's best for them without mm. feeling like they need to conform. Yeah, well, we're certainly all figuring this out at the same time. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate that. Thank you. And after the break, saving a piece of Black history. This is the church that our ancestors built. Harriet Tubman's connection to one Ontario church and what's being done to protect that legacy. Welcome back. Today marks the beginning of Black History Month, dedicated to remembering and celebrating the achievements of black people in Canada. Tonight, our focus is on a small church with huge historical significance. Abolitionist Harriet Tubman helped build it more than 160 years ago. CBC's Magda Gabrasalasa looks at what's being done now to save it. In the city that was the last stop of the Underground Railroad, the church built by freed slaves still stands. Gracing its walls is the face of its most famous member, Harriet Tubman. She's such a heroic figure. This is the church that our ancestors built. And this is the town that she resided in as an Underground Railroad conductor. Rochelle Bush is the historian at Salem Chapel in St. Catharines, Ontario. For years, she's been sounding the alarm that this piece of history was in much need of repair. It's the unevenness of the plank boards. We don't want anybody to trip over that. So you can see where they're separated. Her prayers have now been answered. The church is the recipient of a $100,000 grant through the federal Supporting Black Canadian Communities initiative. We're so grateful we received the money. Money is also being used to honour Harriet Tubman's legacy south of the border. Last week, the U.S. Treasury announced it's moving forward with plans to put Tubman on the front of the American $20 bill. She will replace Andrew Jackson, the seventh U.S. president and a slave owner. She's a representative American hero who deserves to be honored in such a way. Author and historian Catherine Clinton says everyone needs to know what Tubman did. She was one of the few who went south in order to bring people out, to rescue them from slavery and bring them all the way to freedom. A trip she made more than a dozen times, helping dozens and possibly hundreds of people. Back at Salem Chapel, Bush knows all about that. And she can now rest easier knowing this church and Tubman's connection to it will be preserved for future generations. The federal funding will arrive in the next couple of weeks and then the renovations should take about a year. Magda Gebrasalasa, CBC News, St. Catharines. And for more stories about the lives and experiences of black Canadians, go to our page Being Black in Canada on cbc.ca, featuring content from all across CBC with special features during Black History Month. And next on The National, another glimpse into Black History Month. What a young Nova Scotian poet wants people to know. Our moment is next. Damini Owega is just 13 years old, but she is a poet and she has a lot to say. She wrote a poem for Black History Month and performed it as part of a virtual ceremony in Nova Scotia. Tonight, her poem is our moment. On the shoulders of our ancestors we stand, binding together as communities of African descent. This is where we've lived, learned, and listened. Every tongue counted, every story sacred. We've gone through pain. Though we speak our own healing. 
Through the grace of our own survival in this land, African Nova Scotians have fought and continue to fight. Against inequalities, we push on joyfully. We sing songs of victory. In spite of rejection, we strive for perfection because we believe in resurrection, the ability to rise from the dust and emerge like the dawn of a new day. From Halifax to North Preston to East Preston to Hammers Plains to Weymouth Falls to Acaciaville to Turo and all the way to Sydney, together we stand. So perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, she, like a lot of us, was watching another young poet not too long ago. I'm thinking of Amanda Gorman, who delivered a, a poem, beautiful poem, at the presidential and vice presidential inauguration uh, in the United States just a few short weeks ago. And Damini was telling us how she was watching that very closely, very proud, and learned a thing or two from watching Amanda Gorman. Uh, excellent role model there. And I suspect, Damini, you may just be a role model tonight as well. Uh, that's The National for this February 1st. Have a great one.